Hello, Pattern Readers. I am going to be talking about episode 204 of The Wheel of Time in this video, so make sure you have watched that before you continue. This is going to be a similar video to the one I just put out on episodes 201 to 203. I will be giving my perspective on the reasons for a lot of the big choices made in this adaptation, exploring why certain things needed to change from page to screen and what works in a TV series versus a book series. I won't try to cover every detail of the episode in this video, saved some discussion for later videos after we have the whole season, because some choices definitely become clearer once we have a chance to see how things play out. Like last time, I will make some general comparisons to the books. In this episode, mostly pointing out things that are happening in the show that we didn't see happen in the books. In a few specific instances, I will tell you when I briefly discuss a bigger reveal from the books, anywhere from book two to four, but I will always give you the chance to skip those bits if you haven't read the books and don't want to have a potential future reveal in the show spoiled. In general, this episode reminded me a lot of episode five of season one, in that there was a lot of time devoted to character developing scenes. Anyone who's heavily concerned about similarity to the books might not like it because a lot of the scenes straight up are not in the books, but time is being spent to develop the characters, who they are, what is driving them, what are their internal conflicts. To me, that is very important because ultimately we can only be invested in whatever plot points happen with the characters if we care about them. Plot heavy stories that try to rush from beat to beat sometimes fail to get the audience invested. And it's a major risk of adaptations that try to cut down a long form story to a shorter form story if they are too invested in following the same plot outline. One thing I think this episode does that is different from episode 105 is pull off a couple of major and fairly shocking reveals at the end. Overall, a great episode. The scene where Shamael wakes Lanfear by breaking the seal that was holding her is a huge example of something created because of the impact it will have in a visual medium. The set piece creates a dramatic atmosphere. The channeling looks beautiful, and the breaking of the seal makes it pretty clear what is happening. Most of what Ashamael says is in the old tongue, so we won't immediately know exactly who this new Forsaken is, but just knowing another one is in play and the creepy visual of her drenched in blood is enough to create tension. In the books, the Forsaken don't know where any of the seals are, and there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between a seal and an individual Forsaken. I can understand how tying each Forsaken to a seal simplifies explaining that the seal's breaking means that Forsaken are getting loose into the world again. The only issue I could see is if the show wants all of the Forsaken to be loose within the next season or two, they will need some way to explain why the Dark One is not also completely free. Maybe there will be a final seal for the Dark One. Let's talk about Maureen's sister, Anver Damadred, played by the immensely talented Lindsay Duncan. This is a great example of something that might puzzle book fans before they saw it. Why would the show bother to include a non-character like Maureen's sister? She has turned out to be a character that can serve multiple purposes, and that is immensely valuable in an adaptation. First, she served as Rand's introduction to the Game of Houses, played by Kyrienne and Nobility, where immense weight is given to who invites who to dinner and layers upon layers are read into whether someone accepts or declines. In this episode, she is showing us what Maureen's upbringing was like, helping us understand why Maureen might be so secretive and so adept at manipulation. She also is one of the visual indicators of how much younger Aes Sedai appear compared with their actual age, since we learn Maureen is her older sister. This is a great alternative to the way the books describe the look of Aes Sedai as ageless, where you can't tell if they are 20 or 60, something that would be difficult to capture on screen. Instead, we see someone who looks about 40 and their younger sister who looks about 70, and we know that Aes Sedai aging is slowed, and we are reminded of their extended lifetimes. I have a feeling from some of the hints dropped in this episode about Anver's son marrying the queen that we will actually see more from her. But even so far, they are making good use of a new character to accomplish several purposes. Maureen's scene with Loghain. I really like this scene. It was pretty dark, honestly, but very fitting. Maureen made arrangements to have Loghain in Kyrian instead of the White Tower so that she could have access to him and more importantly, so Rand could. She reveals her intention that Loghain teach Rand everything he can about channeling, even though he can no longer channel himself. 
This, while bound to be limited, is one of the few straws she could grasp at to help Rand learn to control the One Power. It honestly makes a ton of sense, practically, because otherwise Rand is without any help. From a character standpoint, though, I love what this tells us about Moraine's state of mind. She knows exactly how much Loghain wants that knife, not to hurt her, but to end his own life. And she knows this especially because she too has been cut off from the One Power. And yet she is still fighting because she has a purpose that drives her and is stronger than her despair. I am going to discuss a reveal from the end of book four, The Shadow Rising, for a moment. So if you haven't read that book, skip ahead to this timestamp. Even if you don't plan to read the books, skip ahead anyway, because this could spoil a future plot point in the show as well. Some people are worried that if Loghain becomes a teacher for Rand, then we won't eventually get Rand capturing Asmodian and making him his teacher. I do not think that is the case. I suspect what Loghain will be able to do will be limited since he is gentled. And if anything, it will make Rand realize that he needs a teacher who can show him actual weaves. So gird your loins, folks, but I still think we are going to get Asmodian. The scene with Alana and her warders visiting her family, of course, gives us a lot of development for Lan. But before I even get into that, what a contrast they also provide to the cold, formal scenes of Moraine's family home in Kyrian. If anything could help us understand the personality differences between these two Aes Sedai, this surely does. Alana also appears to have sisters who show their age more than she does, but there the similarities end. Lan, changing his appearance, hair loose, and colorful clothing also serves as a visual indicator of how he is trying to adapt to what Alana looks for in a warder compared with Moraine. But it has the sense of him trying on a costume. It isn't something that necessarily fits him because he certainly hasn't embraced the idea of bonding himself to Alana. By the way, since the episode says nothing to indicate she has actually bonded him, I have to assume she has not, and is only trying to get him to agree to it so far. This aligns with my expectation that the bond between Lan and Moraine will be restored this season. The scene between Alana and Lan shows that she is giving him the option to come with her and the others to Tarvalon or not, though she also dangles the option of him possibly being able to bond with Nynaeve in the near future. Alana mentioning a major change in Moraine just over 20 years before hints at something mentioned in the show before. I think even non-readers could hazard a guess at that, but I also think it is setting up getting a fuller reveal on that soon, so I will leave it at that for now. This little bit of Lan reading the poem he took for Moraine and then putting it away right before Maxim comes in. Personally, I think he did that on purpose so that whoever followed him would know where to look for it. He already established earlier in the episode that he knows he will be followed the minute he goes off alone. I think he wanted to pass that information on, but not in a way that would have all three of them insisting on going with him when he leaves them. Just a prediction. We'll see. Maxim's sharing with Lan that Alana masks her bond with him most of the time. Well, no wonder he feels like a third wheel. But it also gives Lan encouragement to try again with Moraine. The scene Lan has with Yvonne is my favorite of his in this episode. Ivan instinctively knows that Lan is stuck on something Moraine said to him and draws him out to talk about it. I love the line he has about how people don't realize the quiet ones have the conversation playing in their own heads all the time. It was brilliant, especially for a show trying to adapt several notably terse and taciturn characters like Lan. Ivan has a very different reaction than Lan to the idea that Aes Sedai and Warders are not equals. In his mind, of course they aren't. Aes Sedai are nearly all powerful, but the Warders are there to remind them of their limitations. He definitely gets Lan to at least reconsider his perspective. I love that the show is choosing not to move on right away from the trauma Nynaeve experienced in the Arches. It drives home what a horrible experience the accepted test must have been for her and why she is questioning everything. I find it very believable that Egwene wouldn't know the right words to say since she hasn't been through it herself. It's another wedge between Nynaeve and Egwene. Not just that Nynaeve has advanced to a level in the White Tower that Egwene hasn't achieved, but that the experience one has been through and not the other creates an emotional gulf. Nynaeve even has the far fancier room to drive the point home. Meanwhile, Egwene is confiding more in Elaine, and Elaine both challenges and listens to her. I had to laugh at the way they showed Nynaeve's growing status and reputation in the White Tower through this scene with the warder trainee. He's both in awe of her and flirting so hard and she just levels him with a look. This short scene between Leandrin and Liana shows Leandrin being both nosy and ambitious and lets us know that news of the Shan Chan is starting to spread. Liana serves Leandrin back the most efficient set down. 
and Leandrin in turn comes as close to openly threatening both Swan's power and Liana's as she can. I am not entirely sure what Leandrin's role in the show will be going forward, but there are some hints in this scene, let's just say. When Leandrin meets Nynaeve in the testing chamber, she truly seems like a more authentic version of herself than she does with Liana. I believe she really is remembering and sharing her own pain in the arches. It's remarkable that Leandrin can relate to Nynaeve in a way that Egwene can't, and Nynaeve actually opens up to her. Leandrin, surprisingly, reciprocates and talks about her son when her immediate reaction to Nynaeve finding out about him was to slap her. There's a lot of real emotional vulnerability in this scene, and they manage to also work in the pain I said I experienced by living such long lives that they watch their loved ones grow old and die. And there's an almost perfectly seamless transition from this, I'll hazard to say, real connection into manipulation. Leandrin telling Nynaeve about Loyal and Perrin being captured, as if she doesn't know perfectly well that Nynaeve will try to go to them immediately. Egwene also doesn't hesitate for a second to go with Nynaeve when she tells her why she is leaving. I like how they explain that Egwene is trying so hard in the tower because she doesn't want to fail her friends. She thinks she failed Rand by not being trained enough to go with him to the eye of the world. There's a depth of feeling here that I think is going to come back in a big way when Egwene eventually realizes that Rand is alive. I think the sense of betrayal Egwene will feel is going to be intense, so this will end up being good setup for that. The show handles Elaine going with Egwene and Nynaeve very differently. In the show, she has less reason to choose to go with them. In the books, Leandrin told Egwene and Nynaeve that Rand was in trouble, and at that point in the books, Elaine had met Rand and had a more established friendship with Egwene and Nynaeve, so she chooses to go with them. Here, she doesn't have any time to make a decision, which is probably good because she would not have much of any reason to choose to go. Leandrin shows up and after saying Elaine is a complication and apologizing to Nynaeve, blasts all three of them with air, knocking them out. I have seen that non-readers have varying reactions to what Leandrin did here, and I don't want to spoil which of those reactions is likely to be correct. I know what Leandrin's motivations for luring Egwene and Nynaeve out of the tower are in the book, so I can certainly speculate on what they are here, but at this point in the show, I think there's still some room for doubt, so I don't want to spoil anything. If you have not read all of book two, skip ahead to this timestamp. I kind of love that they are adding so much depth to Leandrin that non-readers really aren't sure whether she is bad or not in the show at this point. Yeah, she knocked them out, but we haven't seen what she's doing with them yet. Yeah, she sent Min to meet Ashamael, but did she know that it would be Ashamael or not? There's still room for uncertainty. And the sense of be betrayal when Leandrin probably reveals herself to be a dark friend is probably going to hit even harder. We sadly only get a little bit of Matt in this episode, but we get a really interesting development from Min. When the person Leandrin sent her to meet turns out to be a Shamael. This is clearly shocking and horrifying to her when he tells her he is one of the Forsaken. And it's not immediately clear if Leandrin knew this would be who Min would meet with. But I love that they are showing us how much Min's visions have been like a curse to her. She has been used her whole life for what she can do, which she has no control over. And she sees horrible things about people that no one wants to hear. So they show us that in this quick scene and we learn that is why she was willing to work with Leandrin. Ashamael himself directly offers to take her visions away. Although seriously, why does he keep telling people he is called the father of lies and then expecting people to believe promises he makes to them? But anyway, she appears to be at least considering bringing Matt to Kyrian as asked. And this is all added, by the way, this whole plot with Min and Matt is not in the books. But the tension here that someone who clearly does not want to have anything to do with the shadow could still be roped into it, might still end up hurting a friend, that's intense. I kind of love this reveal, and I think it could add to Min's complexity as a character that she has to deal with this kind of temptation. Most importantly, I love that the show is really making clear that her gift is for her more like a curse, and that someone in her shoes might consider a lot to be rid of it. Time to skip ahead again if you haven't read through book three for some discussion involving future relationships between characters. I don't think Min will end up fully cooperating with Ishamael, but if she does, even up to a point, I think that may help her relate to Rand. We certainly know by book three that Min loves Rand. We see in this very episode Rand being manipulated by a Forsaken and even having developed feelings for one. 
If man is tempted by one in a different way, that may end up being a point of connection between them. This episode gives Perrin a chance to have some alone time with Elias and the wolves, so we can really start to dig into what it means to be a wolf brother. It's the first time we have heard that name in the show. And the dialogue directly addresses a question some non-readers have that, no, Perrin isn't a werewolf and he isn't going to turn into one. We start to understand that these visions Perrin has been having is the way wolves communicate. And the backwards reveal that Elias was involved in saving Perrin from the White Cloaks helps some pieces start to fall into place. Honestly, though, the visual medium wins again because actually seeing Hopper communicate his name to Perrin and Perrin's joy at communicating with him was so touching. One thing I appreciate in all of the interactions between Celine and Rand that I can talk about more now that she has been revealed as Lanfear is that she is far more subtle than her book counterpart. Maybe this Rand is enough less trusting of people that he wouldn't still want to be with someone who was constantly telling him to think of glory. Lanfear is suppressing parts of her true personality more adeptly here and playing the part of Celine with much more credibility. I can understand why Rand is drawn in by her. And when she builds to the point of telling him, if you want something, you have to take it. It feels like a natural progression, not jarring at all. When the fade appears, I would guess that is not random, that Lanfear drew it in order to get Rand to reveal to her that he can channel. I think she has been playing a long game, but feels it is time to move it along. Although Lanfear would never actually be shocked that Rand can channel or that he hid it from her as she pretends to be, that was necessary to keep the disguise going. Because of course, in the role she has been playing, she would be shocked by that. She manages to fairly smoothly move past that though, to accepting him and telling him not to hide his ability. While that switch on her part could start to raise some red flags, it is understandable why Rand accepts it because he wants so badly not to be seen as a monster. It really seems like Lanfear is quickly running out of her patience with playing a role as she starts to tell Rand she is a monster too. But I think this is in direct response to her interpreting him as saying he loves her. Now I'm not sure he really did fall in love with Celine, but she certainly heard what she wanted to hear. And to Lanfear, who longs more than anything for love from the man who was once loose there in Telamon, that would be enough for her to start dropping her act. I'm not sure she would have said, I am Lanfear, but she clearly was starting to work towards that more quickly. I think she was starting to at least reveal that she can channel and probably show her own appearance before Moraine stabby stabbed her. This whole reveal at the end and the way it played out actually managed to be shocking to me, even though I basically knew what was coming. And yet they had been setting up pieces of this since episode one. I think that was very well done. Now I want to end by talking about a change that involves some later books. So this is the point in the video to sign off if you haven't read through at least book seven, A Crown of Swords. Don't forget to leave me a comment on this episode and subscribe. So early in book six, we have a scene where two characters are introduced who have been resurrected in a way. Their souls placed in new bodies after their previous bodies died. So we learn this is something the Dark One can do. Death is not really permanent where the Dark One is involved. And these characters remember who they were previously. It's not like being reincarnated from birth. They have their previous knowledge and abilities. It takes a while for other characters to realize that Forsaken thought dead might not be so dead. And here in the show, we see instead that Moraine is not able to permanently kill Lanfear, but instead of the Dark One having to resurrect her soul into a new body, she just fairly quickly regenerates. I think this is the show basically simplifying how this resurrection process from the books works. It happens more immediately and the original body is able to be maintained. That certainly helps the show avoid having to recast roles. And it may help both the audience and the other characters to know how much of a threat the Forsaken really are. Wrapping them in air before slitting their throats or surprising them and stabbing them is not going to work to take those players off the board. We also see, if we look closely in Lanfear's eyes as she regenerates, that there are Sa, which is a sign that the true power, power that is drawn directly from the Dark One, is being used rather than the One Power. Really nice and creepy little detail there. So what were your thoughts on episode 204? I think it was a somewhat more controversial one as many people were marking it as their favorites. And then of course, some lamenting since so much of it was not directly from the books. As always, leave me a comment. But if there was something you didn't like, do give us a little bit more of a reason why beyond just it wasn't in the books. And as always, gird your loins, my friends.